different structures of membranes and structures of time constraints, and we focus on the challenges here. And I think to be disruptive, we want to be able to operate membranes at low pressure to get the same flux, so to have more higher permeability materials. Be able to have narrower pore size distributions to increase speciation, and I'm going to show that to you today, to have near isoporous type materials. And also, eventually, uh, looking at how we can impart reactivity or sensing ability to the, to the membranes to know when we should activate maybe the catalysis, that's the case, or how we should actually predict some of the fouling patterns happening across the surface. Uh, these are the classical membrane technologies there, uh, and some of the key challenges here, obviously, besides being inert, relate back to aging and fouling. And there have been a number of catalytic membrane processes developed in the past 20 years plus, let's say, uh, and some are becoming commercial right now. So uh, phantom-like membranes can be purchased off the shelf. Uh, PC membranes and EC membranes also, some companies have commercialized them. So we can see how these new field of membrane science is progressively uh, become moving from pilot level to commercial level. And interestingly, we went to ICOM uh, a few weeks ago, and I think there was nine or 10 sessions on catalytic membrane reactors. The last couple of uh, ICOMs only had one or two sessions. So it shows how quickly the field is growing, and now we're really engaging on developing new materials on new processes to have membranes be a bit more responsive and smart. We have been working on inorganic membranes for a while, uh, CNT based, like I will show you today, carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers, uh, graphene based, carbon on carbon growth, carbon on metals, and so on. So, over the past you know, 12 years, maybe, we have been working on hybridizing carbons mostly on metals and on carbon itself. But today, I will talk about um, the carbon nanotube membrane strategies. And that project really started during my PhD, which was on making carbon nanotube papers. So random mats of CNTs made by filtration of suspensions of CNTs. All right. And <clears throat> that was fine, we got some good results at the end of the day, we published, but the scalability was a major issue. And at the time I was working with Chi Green already, uh, who was one of the research scientists of the CSIRO before she moved to the US to Intech uh, afterwards. And one of the technology which CSIRO was developing was on making spinnable, dry spinnable carbon nanotubes. Meaning you can, have, you can grow the CNT as vertical tubes on a second wafer, pull the edge and come as a web. The way it works is that you have a lot of, uh, you have to control the size of the catalyst on the surface of the wafer in order to have a high packing density of tubes and you generate nano fibers of carbon between the tubes. But when you pull the CNTs, they all come together um, <coughs> sheet by sheet, you know, of the same. So very nice technology. Uh, very, I would say, advanced in terms of growth and, uh, and synthesis uh, by chemical vapor deposition. But CSRO and um, UTexas mastered this, and now I think four companies have spun uh, from uh, this technology. So at the time, we were using some of our CNTs and we were discussing ways to make membranes and so on out of those. <clears throat> and during my PhD, we have been making mixed matrix membranes. We looked at vertically aligned CNTs based membranes, which had a lot of hype. In 2002 and 2004, when the first science and nature papers came out on high flux um, membranes with CNTs, where in that case, the water or the gases were going through the core, through the inner tube of the membranes. But these two strategies had many, many limitations. Uh, this one never went to market because it's too hard to manage and to, to scale up. And these ones, they have too many defects when you make mixed many matrix membranes. Very hard to get reproducibility and to get membranes where you can actually have narrow pore size distribution again, and to, in a way, justify the cost of the CNT. So what we have been looking at is making ultra-thin membranes with the CNTs that LeanTech now is providing and, and synthesizing, and trying to understand how we can actually control the orientation of the CNTs to control pore size, electrical conductivity especially, and how we can minimize the thickness of these membranes to minimize the cost of the materials in the end. So we have this strategy where we start from uh, CNT grown on um, wafers. Um, Lintech grows them on up to 12 inch wafers, so it's quite a large surface, which uh, for a single wafer will give us enough uh, surface to generate about 500 square meter of membranes. Okay, so 12 inch gives us 500 square meter, it's just to give you an idea. We can pull these CNT that I will show you in a sec, we get them semi-aligned, then we have different ways to condense the web together to actually compact and increase von der Waals forces within the CNTs. And that leads to having different um, uh, 
compactness of materials, which you can either put on a support, like we have here, on a PSF membrane, uh, we have them also on carbon fibers, metal substrates, or that can be self-standing. This membrane here is about 300 nanometer thick, okay? And it's very flexible and, and strong already. And if we try to look at the video... So, like that. so here, what you have is a CNC web being spun and being collected onto a PSF membrane. Uh, you see on the right-hand side where the wafer is. Yep. So, sorry. Okay. So here it starts from a wafer. We have a web which is about 15 nanometer in thickness coming out. Uh, and we can actually control the orientation, like I will show you in a sec, of the CNTs and um, collect them onto virtually any support. Now, depending on the support we use, the adhesion of the CNTs might be more or less strong, and we can maintain them on the support or remove them afterwards. So that's one more way we can get those self standing for that membrane. That system was in Dikin uh, before I left, and we have the same one now in, uh, in Khalifa. Um, so if you look at the, number, the impact of the number of layers, we optimize that quite a lot. Uh, obviously, the more layers we have, the denser we can get uh, in terms of structure we can become. So we had carbon nanofiber support initially, just to give us a nice um, uh, support, which had actually pore <coughs> size around uh, a couple of microns. And then we found that when we reach 20 to 30 layers of CNTs, which again has about 300 nanometer of thickness, then we have a near defect-free material with very narrow pore size distribution like I will show you after. We went up to 500 layers just for the sake of demonstration and we can we show also that other properties like compactness, uh, mechanical strength and electrical quantity could be improved. But from 30 layers, let's say, we have enough um, cohesiveness and conductivity to apply them as members. But uh, one of the nice things we can do is also orientate the, the layers at different angles. So they are not always in uh, the same direction. You can remember 45 or 90 or any angle you want. And that does affect a lot the pore size of your material. You can see here, for instance, for a 30 layer membrane with a zero um, a degree angle, so all of the CNT is in the same direction, we have about a 55 millimeter average pore size. Fairly narrow, a bit broad, but still fairly, fairly narrow. And as we orientate the CNT at 40 or 90, uh, we can progressively decrease at 45 degrees the, the pore size down to about 30, um, a bit less, um, sorry, 30 to 33 nanometers, I think. Yeah. So we have some control on pore size quite accurately just by changing the way the CNTs are organized together, which can be done in a single step uh, by pulling out the CNTs and wrapping them around the substrate um, with different apparatus. Uh, and obviously, if you look at the impact of the layers here, uh, as we increase the number of layers, we decrease pore size. Like I said, for 30 layers, we get down to about uh, 50 nanometers here. And for 60 layers, we have a sharp decrease down to about 22 nanometers. So again, we can cover very accurately this pore size distribution, which I think is a bit of a graph in membrane science. Um, we looked, and I will skip that, at the electrical conductivity of the system. And like I was saying, when we reach 30, uh, four, between 20 and 30 layers, we have quite high um, uh, electrical conductivities, uh, which become very similar to what you expect for uh, about 70% of, of pure CNT based uh, materials. And we use these membranes for filtration, but also for photo and electrocatalytic uh, reactions. The idea for us was to see how we can actually control the degradation of compounds as they come and contact the surface of the membranes, and also uh, evaluate the impact that the char on the surface of the membrane could have on the permeation. So I will not talk about that today, but that's something we're also doing right now with Unitech as part of the second package of the, of the work there. So these are the modules we had, which uh, Ahmed was working with, uh, which we designed. So this is one of the PEC, photoelectrochemical uh, catalytic uh, filtration module. So the UV light comes there, and inside we have those contactors uh, where the membrane can actually be charged uh, electrically. So we developed those by 3D printing and we could utilize them uh, for a different membrane testing. Uh, that gives you an idea of the water permeance of membranes. So the, the CNF have a carbon nanofibers here, obviously very large pore size, and as we increase the number of layers of CNTs, the flux goes down, but for the 30 layer of CNT, we have still roughly, let's see if I round up, 2.8 thousand liter per square meter hour bar. So the permeability is actually quite high, way higher than equivalent UF membranes. Okay. 
These membranes have been plasma surface treated to make them more hydrophilic. Okay, so it's not pure CNC, there is a mild oxygen plasma down to hydrophilize the surface, just to disclose uh, everything here, for all these samples. Okay. Um, in terms of reactivity, the K here is the K of reaction for electrocatalysis. Again, uh, quite decent reactivity, uh, rates of reactions around uh, 30 layers, that correlates back to the electrocatalysis we had before. And also, we looked at the um, cyclability uh, of the samples, and we had some mild decay over time, uh, about 7% on, after 8 uh, run, which was attributed to the fact that we had some surface fouling happening on the material. And that's really the core of the work we're doing with LinkedIn right now on the membranes to actually understand how we can utilize these materials to do cell cleaning by actually having some kind of pulse on pulse off uh, current across the membrane to prevent adhesion of contaminants and also by um, burning off, in a sense, whatever comes onto the surface. The second part of the talk today, and I will go through quickly, uh, it's more material-based, is actually to see how we can design not only electrocatalytic, but photoelectrocatalytic membranes. And obviously the CNTs don't have a bend gap, so they are not reactive to light. Uh, not really. They have so over light, they don't actually generate any electrons uh, from that absorption. So we put tin oxide, I mean I put tin oxide on the surface, and we could actually see here the coating by atomic layer deposition, about 25 nanometer of TI uh, SNO2 around the CNT itself. And we could control again pore size and the electrochemical uh, properties of the material this way. Um, without going into too much details, I want to highlight two things. Um, first is that that thickness of 20 to 25 nanometer is the maximum we should go up to in order to still utilize the CNTs as electron sinks during the catalytic process. If we go thicker, then the light doesn't penetrate and the electrons cannot cross. Uh, the resistivity is too high. So we, we, oh, we actually calibrated the system around that 20 to 25 uh, nanometer, which was around the 250 cycles uh, per se. And the second thing is that obviously by just changing the amount of tinoxin we put, we can control pore size and the porosity of the materials once more. Uh, we optimized the depositions. I, I will skip that and did some um, photocurrents and also uh, characterization of the, um, of the stability of the materials there. Uh, look around here. Also, to try to understand the um, oxygen evolution reaction and potential for the samples and the bend gap, which was affected by the nanonucleation of the tinoxide on the surface of the carbon nanotubes. But in terms of performance, uh, first of all, here we have the um, uh, degradation of methylene blue and um, acetaminophen uh, here, uh, and which we actually assessed based on the amount of uh, tinoxide present in the system. And again, like I said, around the 2025, we're reaching the plateau in terms of performance because of that critical thickness of the metal oxide on the surface of the, of the materials. So this we optimized with a lot, and the flux also was quite good. Uh, the membranes were much more hydrophilic, so even by increasing uh, the amount of tin oxide, we managed to maintain the flux and actually to have more flux initially uh, compared to the, um, uh, to the uh, original uh, CNC-based membranes. Another thing we saw is that as we increased voltage across the membrane, we had some level of enhancement of permeation, quite significant by a factor of up to five, let's say, across the board. So quite nice to see that you can actually enhance the permeation of water, in that case, across the membranes, just by having a mild, let's say, two volt per module uh, potential applied to the system. This is very fundamental, and we are trying to scale that now with uh, the insect in the US. <coughs> Um, I will skip this one, but just to let you know that we also use these membranes for uh, virus capture and denaturation. Obviously, it was during COVID that this work happened, so it was a bit topical, let's say. And we use one of the strain of coronavirus for the, um, this testing. The idea being that we wanted to understand not only the adsorption, but the denaturation of the viruses by contact, which was quite high. And uh, in a nutshell, we managed to get up to nearly seven log removal. So not seven nines, uh, 99.59s uh, of removal, which was quite uh, interesting. And now Lintech is commercializing those membranes um, with some partners in the US. So in a nutshell, I wanted to show you what I think is a bit of a nice project which spanned with um, an industry partner, um, both at the very fundamental level and now looking at the scale up and the application side. We have been working only on the water aspect of Lintech does work in gas and also uh, air filtration as well. If I still have a couple of minutes, thank you. 
I want to talk about what is my major project right now in Khalifa, on, uh, which is not membranes, so uh, I've been you know, unfaithful anyway, uh, which is on atmospheric uh, water generation. And um, as I showed you at the start, the UAE is a very dry country, like most of the Middle East, you know. And um, the uh, government is trying to understand how we can develop strategies to um, sustain water production in a more sustainable manner, let's say. And one of these techniques, and they have commissioned us to assess that, is to look at um, the capture of moisture from the air. At any given time around Earth, there is close to 500,000 cubic kilometers of water in the atmosphere. So there's actually a lot of water present there. And that water cycle replenishes water in about 10 days. And that's a natural cycle, obviously. <clears throat> at the moment, for our uh, consumption, we only need about 600 cubic kilometers. So it's about 1%, let's say, uh, less on that, what is in the atmosphere. Obviously, like for any capture or separation process, we have to pay a penalty. It's not free to get that water. We have to pay the energy penalty somehow. But if you look at the numbers, having some decentralized systems, maybe not as big as our own plants, where we need water, especially in desertic or you know, um, remote location, could make sense. So that's why we have this project right now to evaluate the suitability of commercial systems, develop new systems and new technologies in Khalifa and materials to try to push a bit that um, agenda of government, let's say, uh, to market. Um, <clears throat> I will skip that just some calculations on how much water is present uh, in the air uh, based on the um, like graph. And just in terms of showing you what is commercially available, right now, the vapor compression refrigeration systems, the CRS, are the most major systems on the market right now. Uh, I put 10,000 liters per day of production maximum here. Some systems go larger, actually. But um, you can get them over shelf in a container the size of a 12-foot uh, container uh, already out there very easily. The thermoelectric cooling uh, is also very good. Much less energy requirements compared to the CRS, but much less water production per system. And the sorption system are becoming now very popular. And uh, on Tuesday, we've done some of our work uh, and patents we, are, we have put recently on these uh, sorption systems uh, also in Haifa. But the idea is that when we set up a project, we have to actually to select some of the technologies there, which one we want to showcase and uh, commercially speaking. And, uh, and install on the platforms. And if you look at how the UAV weather uh, ranges across the year, obviously we rarely have temperatures below 20 degrees. I mean, overnight in winter, we, we might go down to 14, 15, but you know, 20 average is what we get, 22. Uh, and also we get up to 55 in August, in plain summer, so very hot. Humidity is quite high. We rarely go below 55% and we go easily above 80% average. So that means it's not a bad platform to try to capture that humidity uh, from the air. And both of these CRS systems, and I'm going to show you pictures of, of the platform we have developed after this, uh, are very simple in fact. It's like an air conditioning system. It's modified and improved, but it's uh, nothing more than this. We have a moist air coming in with some HEPA filter to capture the dust and um, maybe some uh, you know, bugs, whatever can get there. We have an evaporator slash condenser which is present in the system, and the water is being collected, uh, treated with different membranes, UV sterilizers, and so on, and then remineralized uh, for either agriculture or human uh, consumption. Obviously, the system itself is uh, fairly, it's purely mechanical, let's say. Uh, there is not too much uh, chemical engineering involved there. And now we're trying to see how we can modify the surface of the materials for the condensers and also we have a future to improve uh, those processes. Just to give you an idea of the uh, collection range for sorption and DCRS, which are some of the most major uh, systems, one company in Austria, which we had talk, uh, talks with, actually claimed they could produce up to 120,000 cubic meters of water per day uh, with a single plant, which would be very competitive compared to a classical RO uh, membrane. Uh, uh, and that plant will have a radius of about five kilometers. Okay, so it's nearly a, a small, a small city uh, with underground tunnels and uh, ways to have actually natural cooling of, of the air um, through by using the uh, latent heat from the from the, the ground, in a sense. But what we have right now, all our systems, <laughs> I'm sorry, have about a ten thousand liter per day uh, production uh, capacity. 
and we have two platforms, uh, one in the city, uh, in the campus itself. So Khalifa has uh, three campuses. So we are based in the uh, engineering one right there in the center. And uh, our uh, site is around here in that in the next to the uh, teaching buildings. And we have actually four uh, commercial systems. You can see three on the picture right now here. Each of them able to produce about 10,000 liters per day. So we are producing roughly, uh, at the moment, 30 to 35,000 liters per day of water uh, on, a, on a good day. Less if it's drier, but I would say between 20 and 30 uh, on average. We use that water for um, irrigation of the campus uh, because we didn't have permission to use it for drinking purpose, obviously, although it is potable, but we use that to get the trees and the grass around the campus. And we are producing about half of the water of the entire campus with these uh, three systems right now. And we have the same thing in the desert, uh, which is about 250 k's from Abu Dhabi, um, in um, an area called uh, um, Al Daha, uh, in the center of the um, Medina Zayed um, uh, municipality. And same, exactly the same uh, system with three systems. We have a fourth one now, but uh, three systems installed. And we also use that water there for two applications. One is irrigation. The second is to use them uh, because we get distilled water pretty much out of the systems. Um, our site is here. What you see on the left hand side is one of the largest concentrated solar uh, platform uh, in the Middle East. And so we have lots of mirrors to concentrate the solar light and we use that water to clean, uh, part of the water to clean uh, their um, solar panels and, uh, and, and mirrors in the system. So they, use, they need about 100 cubic meters per day of water to clean them, and we provide roughly a quarter of that water. Uh, so it's uh, a way to valorize um, the water differently. And again, because water comes ionized, we don't need to uh, demineralize water, which we get from the tap uh, or by truck otherwise. Now, um, is it really economically viable? And the cost, energy cost is quite high. At the moment, based on our systems, it's not a fair comparison, but we are doing some LTA right now. The cost of having water from uh, AWG is about five to seven times higher than our road. So it's not cost competitive, to be honest. However, there are ways for to reduce that cost and also to couple to renewable energies, which would obviously reduce a lot uh, the, the, the cost of energy. Not really the amount of energy, but just the cost. Uh, our road. So we're looking at some of these energy mix strategies right now. And we're also trying to see how we can go beyond just water generation, looking at atmospheric mining. And that's what I was looking for for CO2 and, and hydrogen. And in that case, what we are trying to do is to move from a fairly linear uh, approach where we have that VCRS unit, which we have to power, where we get obviously moist air in and dry air out and in and water, to a system where we can actually integrate um, extraction of other variable gases like helium, uh, CO2, and so on. Because we get very dry air, about 10 to 15 percent humidity dry air, which is required anyway to extract any of the gases from, from the atmosphere, if you want to. You cannot use moist air, it's not going to work. And the second thing is to use part of the water we produce to actually power the system. So we have one project right now looking at producing hydrogen uh, from the water produced, which is DNI, so quite high quality already, and then uh, with fuel cells, uh, power back uh, the systems. But you can also reduce part of the energy requirement for the entire uh, system by using a fraction, maybe 20%, of the water we produce to power the entire uh, unit. One thing we want to do, we haven't done yet, is to look at ammonia production uh, from this. But that's maybe for the future, uh, I don't know. At least we try to have a more uh, circular approach, and the next study of project from September mm -hmm. this year to um, September 2025, we look at implementation of some of these strategies on the platform uh, itself. So that's it for me today. I hope I didn't go too much of a time. Uh, some uh, strong, obviously, partners uh, in Australia and beyond. Uh, some companies, I really want to highlight Lintech here, who has been, has been sponsoring the research on the membrane catalytic reactors, and the Executive Affair Authority, which is actually the Office of His Highness, uh, the President of the UAE, who paid uh, the entire project on the atmospheric uh, water generation. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. And before I finish, I have a little advertisement. Uh, we have obviously MEMDES uh, happening in uh, November in Spain, in the CGS. Um, we are still open for posters, but if you want uh, to submit any abstracts, let us know. We can try to push them through in the next uh, 
to follow books. But I think we have a number of people from UTS already who submitted our track, so it's uh, yep. very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, my this is a little um, I missed the part to do with uh, the cost so using the um, recovery of uh, moisture from air using the uh, the CRS yeah. so how much is it costing per cubic meter please so how, what what would be the, the cost per cubic meter yeah of, of water yeah so based. yeah, no, it's it, it's wrong. So right now we're doing some calculations based on this, and obviously we're trying to benchmark against RO. But if we benchmark against tap water, because our water comes from RO in the UE, because of the economy of scale, it's not a fair comparison. <coughs> so we are actually trying to compare to small RO systems, which would have similar footprint slash you know production capabilities. Right now, producing <coughs> one cubic meter of water on the campus for what it takes cost about 55 US dollars per cubic meter. Uh, per cubic meter. Per okay. But this is not a commercial price. This is what it costs us to produce on site. So the, the number is irrelevant to any other you know, obligations. Mm -hmm. When you talk to some of the companies, and I cannot disclose the names there, where we purchase the systems from, mm -hmm. when they integrate that with solar panels and so on, they get down to roughly a couple of dollars per cubic meter. So still more on our water, like I said, a factor of five to 10. But we are getting in a range where it could be competitive if you don't have to be installed in infrastructures to deliver your water from your our plant down to your site. Because most of the cost is a civil engineering cost at the end of the day, a capex. Well, what about the energy? Like, what's the proportion of energy usage in that $55 dollars yeah. you're talking? Yes. Is so it a it's about 60%. 60% yes. energy. On a five year return um, depreciation plan. And 40%. Um, on capex machinery and like people engineering. And, and engineers to and to salaries and stuff yeah. Yeah. and the salaries being also <coughs> reasonably high in the UE that also affects that okay so we did calculations for what it cost us on the site and that's the value but having something more optimized like the companies uh, have been business models for their customers can decrease the cost extensively so you mentioned if we use solar power to uh, power the, the yep. equipment that would reduce it to a couple of dollars per cubic meter? Yes, yeah, two to three dollars per cubic meter. Yes. And how does that compare to uh, conventional uh, water sourcing? Yeah, so like I said, we are doing some SCA and technical economic analysis right now, uh, and we actually get information for some of the RO suppliers that provide small systems. We don't have all the information yet, so we haven't finished that analysis okay. uh, yet to be very fair. Um, but for sure, it would be closer, but it would still be higher. Again, the point for whoever wants to install this is to try to see what is the cost to bring the water or to build the infrastructure to deliver the water. And often, when you get the water on the tap, you don't have that, you know, part of the cost, including to what you pay. It's, it's not considered. So I think here for us, try to, we're not trying to compete anyway, we're not selling the systems. We just want to assess the feasibility. And we also have technical issues to run them because of the heat and the sand mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And also, if it could be relevant um, from um, a technology applicability to the country right now. Do you guys like pay a lot of money for maintenance of the equipment, knowing the the, the sand storms yeah. and all that, the overheating? Yeah. So what's the just roughly what's the percentage of? That no, I don't have. I'm not sure exactly. But okay. it's, uh, it's, it's, significant. It's, it's significant. It's significant. It's significant. Yes. Okay. And because of the heat, because of the sands, because of um, very large variation of temperature between day and night, we have lots of failures, which we knew from the start, but you know, which represent a major maintenance cost to the operation. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. So when you say failure, uh, I missed that. Yeah. What exactly do you mean? You said between day and night. Well, we have up to 30 degrees, 40 degrees variation of yeah. temperature yeah. between day and night in the desert sometimes. Yeah. So that leads to some aging of some components. Oh, okay. So we have failures arising from uh, freezing of the night of some systems and then, you know, uh, floating in, in the morning, for instance, which has happened on different farms and compressors. So this, this happens a lot.
Yeah, fair enough. Thank you for that. No, fair enough. That is so very, very interesting. Very interesting. And in, uh, I've, I've heard of this system a long time ago, and I wasn't sure it was generated. Well, who came up with it? Uh, but obviously, you guys adopted the system, and you're trying to, to improve it and perfection it, which is great. <coughs> Do you think that that uh, in the future that'll be something really important, like globally? Globally, I'm not sure, but uh, there are areas, even in Australia, where like I, I just did a road trip from Perth to Alice Springs, and several times we had to drink desalinated water inland. And is that sustainable? I don't know. Okay, so I think in some contexts for remote populations, for mining, for areas which are really you know out of a grid, it could make sense mm -hmm. um, to produce water for Sydney. Probably not, but again. At some point, it's a policy issue and policy uh, aspect for government to decide. You know, but currently, the cost is high. But like I said, some of the work we're doing on adsorbent right now have much, much lower cost of absorption of, of capture. So I think it could become competitive. But if you look at RO in the 70s, 80s, people would just literally spit on it. You know, they would not touch it or come. No, and now we see whatever. So it's a matter of time and, and I would say effort to make it more viable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just my last question, yeah. if you don't mind. No, that's right. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot the question. I lost, my, I lost my chain of thought. Sorry, it was just the last question. Sorry, I'll, it'll come. Sorry, yeah. It'll come if someone else would like to ask a question. Uh, uh, thank you for a very uh, nice presentation. Okay. I just wanted to understand, like, how can we know how much, like, how do we measure the amount of moisture or humidity that is present in the atmosphere? Like, how do you measure? Okay, uh, we have hygrometers, yeah. uh, so we use them for monitoring, you know, 24 hours. Uh, you were explaining some kind of graph, I just I was curious. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. You mean... Yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. the psychometric graph, okay. Yeah, so we can actually, this is just an abacus, nothing more, okay? Yeah. So depending on your um, temperature and humidity relative, you can calculate how much um, gram of water are present in your system in a sense, okay? Yeah. So this is just defined, you have to <coughs> calculate them, you know, from um, the average flow and, and, you know. So this is actually quite, uh, just basically just mathematics. <coughs> but yeah, we evaluated the amount of, um, the mass of moisture per cubic meter of the mass of the air uh, to evaluate the range of operability, let's say, that uh, we would be into depending. So we are measuring, we are recording temperature, RH all the time, uh, CO2 content, um, dust, PM 2.5. I mean, we are, we are getting lots of data, and now we try to understand. The stuff I was mentioning was maintenance. You know, we have lots of clogging of the HEPA filters, obviously. So we look at the pressure differential also across the HEPA filters. 24-7, you know, when we have to do our maintenance, cleaning, so we are, we are going to bring many, many parameters to try to optimize the, these aspects of maintenance and prevent failures, like I was saying before. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a difference between the water generation at night and daytime? Yep. It's much, much higher at night, obviously, because the temperature goes down and so your RH mm -hmm. relativity goes up. So, um, but when we have 70% humidity during the day, even at 45 degrees, mm -hmm. we still get a lot of water, but the production is not linear. You know, it's not even over the mm -hmm. day. We get the peak from 8, 9 p.m. until 5 a.m., and then we have a dip until again that. And some of the things we are considering now is should we shut off the systems during the day when it's 55 degrees? Because we don't produce so much water compared to the night, mm -hmm. and we can protect the equipment as well. So these are considerations we are having in terms of operation, which is not scientific, but which is purely engineering. Can I just one? So this is the like active kind of uh, yep. water capture. So are you working on passive kind of water yep. capture? It's maybe I. Would feel that there's maybe more energy yep. um, saving than the hair flow because when you look at the hair flow, it's quite a significant amount of energy required. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we have put two patents mm -hmm. on uh, adsorbents, we put 12 students recently on adsorbents, um, alginate based, uh, let's say adsorbents, and now we are capturing nearly um, 8 grams per gram of water per day, uh, per cycle, sorry, of, uh, yeah, yeah, which starts to be 
competitive. So we are also building a pilot for that student shooting as part of the winner right now on the platform. So like I said, the main, I would say, mandate for us is to assess these DCRS technologies, but also to develop technologies locally. And that's what we look at at solvents, uh, the thermogenic cooling, and other things. With some, I'm not leading all the projects. Some partners on the platform are also leading those. I'm, I'm the director for the platform, but I'm not leading all the research projects happening. And so we have these different projects trying to see if we can make more cost cost competitive, you know, or um, yeah, we can generate IP uh, for that matter. So yes, we do that. Just my last question is, uh, you mentioned that the generated water, you use it either for cleaning the solar panels or for irrigation. Do you, do you guys treat the water before you, obviously not for clean if you don't need to treat it clean, but for irrigation, do you add any minerals to it before you use it? Yep, so we have a um, mineralism cartridge system, which is at the back there, and we are remineralizing the water, similar right. to tap water in the UAE, which is less mineralized from here. Okay, it is, it is less okay. But we are following the um, the, the guidelines of the uh, Ministry of Water in terms of discharge. Not for the cleaning of our mirrors, we get the semi ionized. It has a bit of source because some source travel in the air, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's very low. We are at TPT, you know, low PPB levels. Um, and uh, so we don't treat that, but otherwise we remineralize for any other application. And is it like when you say irrigation, you mean irrigation just uh, like the lawns and on the metals or for everything like uh, no. veg fruit, fruit and veggies? Um, they, some companies, uh, some farms, have purchased these systems and they use them for tomatoes, remember, growth in greenhouses. And it's safe, I suppose. And, and it's fine. But not, but not for drinking. For drinking, the systems are meant to be uh, suited for it. And in fact, some people use them in resorts for the water purpose. But at the university, we didn't get clearance to. So I drank it, and we had VIPs coming, and we had to drink it before them, and it was fine. I didn't get sick or anything. But we don't have clearance to make it open to students no. or staff. All right. It's not licensed yet. Okay. It's licensed for companies, but on campus, we didn't get permission for it. So only for trees and not. Thank you for that.